Welcome to today's episode of Positively Geared. Lloyd Edge won't be joining us today as he's unwell with a cough and uh, he's taking a well-deserved rest at home. But not that that matters. We've got a fantastic guest with us in the studio today, Andrew O'Sullivan. He is an environmental landscaper and ex-host of Gardening Australia. Andrew, really uh, happy to have you on the show today. Thanks for coming. Yes, thanks for ha- having me here, Alex. And uh, sad that uh, Lloyd's a little bit ill, but uh, being COVID safe, I guess that's what we've got to do. Absolutely. The the new world we live in, 2020. So, Andrew, we've got so much to talk about and, as always, not a lot of time. So, we're going to get straight into it. For those who know you, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there listening today that would have seen you on the, the big screen before, but for also those who don't, we'd love to just know a bit about your story and what sort of led you to where you are today. I know that you've done quite a bit in your time and you're a really big advocate for environmentalism and the reuse of materials. Tell us about your story. I guess my background starts as a child. Growing up in the western suburbs, we were quite poor and we needed, I guess by necessity, we had to salvage and reclaim and reuse materials. Uh, My mother wanted to have all the gardening things and the animals and ducks and chickens and the only way we could do that was going find materials and build our chicken pens and etc, etc. From moving from the western suburbs into the eastern suburbs, there was a big financial jump, but I still took the same principles with me, and now I was putting secondhand or reclaimed or in the old days, junk, into million dollar properties. And it was well respected by a lot of the owners over there and it just boomed me into another world. It took me into the media world. So people were saying, wow, look at this. This is great what this guy's doing. The head of the ABC at the time said, you know, I don't care what it takes. I want you on the ABC, on the Gardening Australia program. So yeah, I was the Sydney host for that for you know, six and a half years. Went into other media avenues. I moved to Leichhardt after that, uh, after building a big home in the eastern suburbs and, and selling that for some great money. We topped the highest price paid in, in Tamarama at the time. And that house was all developed by secondhand reclaimed materials. Went to Leichhardt, got another property over there, bought the roof of a building, uh, which was the laundry. And I turned that into a penthouse, same, from reclaimed materials. So I'd go around salvaging things. And w- one of the big important things I actually learned was the difference of words, how powerful words are. At the time, you know, demolition was a big thing. So in property, you know, people would buy properties go and demolish them and then to make way to build their dream. And and I didn't realise why it annoyed me so much. And it was the power of the word. The word demolition is to destroy, to take it away from this place. I went, ran for council, literally, just to change the word to deconstruction. Let's pull them apart. Let's take those materials and put them into their homes. And from that, you can utilise them to build your decks, your pergolas, whatever it is you're trying to construct in your property and save you a lot of money. Because when you really look at it, the waste costs involved can far outweigh the landscaping costs to go and buy the new materials. Major benefits. So it just got me more and more passionate about it. And and from there, I've I've bought another property up the coast. And so I've got a five-acre rainforest right near the beach. And I'm building my own education facility all based on that concept of respecting and reusing resources and to teach people to, I guess, the, the key word for me is respect. Respect everything. So, Andrew, it's really interesting just hearing sort of where you've started and some of the, the amazing things that you've done. We were talking briefly before we hit the record button and we're talking about the term recycling. And I really like the example you just used with Leichhardt Council, you know, deconstruction versus demolition. A lot of us aren't necessarily recycling, are we, even though we think we might be? We've been led to believe that the word recycle is good. But if you look what they call the waste hierarchy, okay, the waste hierarchy is the three R's. On top of that pyramid is reduce consumption. So where possible, don't use it. The second step down is reuse. So if you've got another use for it, so even for, a, I don't know, say a bottle, for example, how can you reuse it? Fill it up again. And the third one is worst case scenario, if you can't reduce the consumption, if you have to buy it, if you can't reuse it somehow, then recycle it. Now, this is where the myth gets sort of mixed up a little bit because most people think they recycle. But in reality, the three arrows that you have on the recycling symbol, the first arrow is to break it down to its natural form. Now, I can ask you the question, do you do that? Absolutely not. Yeah. The second arrow is to reprocess it back into something else, generally using chemicals, fuels, fossil fuels, etc. I ask the question again, do you do that? I think the answer is going to be no to all Mm. of them. (laughs) And then the third arrow along the bottom is to sell it. Now, do you do that? 
No. So really, if you're not completing those three arrows, that full cycle, you're actually not recycling anything. So you're either working for a recycling company and giving them some of your materials and resources. Even the recycling companies who are deemed recycling companies, they're generally collecting the materials, separating, then sending it to a third operator, generally overseas in our case, and they're processing and breaking it down. The sad thing is that then that comes back as an inferior product and we're generally getting it back as 20 cents throwaway items so it's a it's a downgrading process whereas if we take a step back up the hierarchy instead of recycling focus on reusing one of the biggest benefits is if you really look at the finances of it recycling puts money in corporate companies pockets and reuse puts it back in your pocket and so how can this be tied back into landscaping or into into property investment materials cost a lot of money and sometimes these materials are are beautiful weathered hardwoods bricks concrete we've done projects where we've had a, a complete zero waste policy and even waste in itself there's actually no such thing as waste everything can be reused everything if I say to people who recycles 90% of the audience will put their hand up and go yes I do and then once I run through through the concept of it they all put the hand down really oh I don't recycle anything so Andrew in Lloyd's book positively geared there's a key concept that a lot of listeners would now really be up to speed with which is the the idea of manufacturing equity in an investment property and that can be in the form of instant equity and how we do that is through adding improved value to an existing home that we might own as part of a portfolio. What I love about what you're doing and and on so many levels obviously at the forefront the fact that it's quite simply the best way forward for the environment and we can only imagine if everybody adopts these practices what a better and cleaner world we're going to live in but if we can just for a moment bring it back to people listening today that might think okay great well this sounds fantastic and you know we haven't considered repurposing or reusing existing materials we were just going to be wasteful and either knock a room out and then take it to the tip or organize a skip bin at the front how can people get started so that they too can start to benefit from from these practices well num- number one is assessing the materials that you have now, this can start from the front door. Something actually I like to, I guess, reflect on is I went to a real estate conference in uh, Vanuatu many years ago. And one of the things that they shared, one of the stories, they took a group of real estate agents to a building and they took the group through there and the real estate agents loved the property. It was amazing. They took a second group through and all they did was put a dead cockroach at the front door. The second group went through the building. They said it was okay, it was, but there was just something about it. What it was was first impression. The first impression is going to be carried through the property. And if you don't dress the front of the property up well, you're going to carry that cockroach through you. And, and these real estate group, they didn't know what it was, but they couldn't get it out of their head that it was, there was just something. Landscaping is the same. If you can dress the front of your property and that entry point and that the moment you step in there, if you have a feeling that it's something beautiful about it or something catches your eye, you're going to carry that through the whole property. So the first impression is very important. Often when they go in to do their renovation or do whatever, there's going to be some advanced tree or most people go in and cut them down and they think, oh, I'll landscape later. That one tree, for example, could be worth $10,000. So all of a sudden, they, they're actually cutting down such a valuable resource that could be that key plant that's sitting at the front entry, which is going to be the first impression. The timber from the pulling out the walls or the roof, that could be a pergola sheltering the entry. So dressing up the property from the reclaimed materials is, is to me, such an important part of it. And Andrew, I think for anybody that might be listening and thinking, okay, that sounds great in principle, but that might not give me the materials I need to create the home I want. If we can just take a bit more of a deep dive into the Tamarama home you done, which was pretty much completely renovated under those principles and that was as you said the highest sale price at the time in the suburb i mean that in itself shows that there has always been or definitely previously been and now would be today and in the future an appetite for people to still want to buy homes like that well the key thing to remember is most base materials in building and landscaping are the same they're either timber brick masonry and so whether they're old or new they can still be dressed to make them look like whatever the end theme is detailed. I can take, you know, old timbers, for example, I can make them old rustic looking, I can make, I can sand them back and make them into a more modern style or bricks I can render over them or the the old sandstone blocks can be sawn and, and formed up. So... The theme, it comes from depending on what colour and what furnishings you put there, I can dress up anything. So, yeah, we don't need to go, oh, because they're old materials, it's going to look old. No, that's not the outcome. 
So we took this old single-storey fisherman's cottage and turned it into a three-storey Tuscan villa, all built from second-hand reclaimed materials, but how we finished it was the important part. It's such a great case study, and Lloyd and I speak a lot, and he particularly emphasises this in his book, Positively Geared, about the ability to save where you can in the sense of, you know, if you're if you're improving a home, you might decide to take, take a couple of days off to paint it yourself as opposed to getting a painter. So the idea is that where you can save, you do. And, and I suppose also looking at the, this concept here, Andrew, there's definitely money to be saved recycling or, excuse me, reusing materials. Thank you. <laughs> Um, as opposed to just going to Bunnings or to the shop and, and having to buy everything brand new and quite simply just throwing out the old stuff. Some of the beauty as well is, is yes, the financial gain, fantastic. The instant impact, save you saved a big frange of penny. It was a good specimen. If you looked at it at the wrong time of the year and it's got no leaves on it and you're going, oh, get rid of it. But at the right time of the year when it's in full flower and looking stunning, that plant can be worth $20,000. You know, So when you look at the value of these things, uh, we did a project down the road down here, down at Curl Curl. We turned an old derelict scout hall into a creative arts centre, so it's now known as the creative space. We had a zero waste policy from that. Even the old toilet block we pulled down, we built all the retainer walls around the property, we put all the rubble into gabion cages. Out of the whole reconstruction and, and, and redesign, making the art gallery, only one cubic metre went to landfill. And that's incredible. I've never in my time heard of anything you know, with such minimal wastage for lack of a better term. That's fantastic. And what I think a lot of people would be interested to know, Andrew, is what was the follow-on effect of, of doing something like that in terms of the response you got from council, uh, possibly the media? I mean, you're, you're very much a pioneer in this space. Initially, they found it challenging because you don't know what you're going to play with or what you have to play with until you've pulled it out. And they like to know what they've got or where they're going and how much it's going to cost. So there, there are a couple of unseen parts of a project when you're reclaiming and reusing materials. But the benefits, the outcome, the council won multiple awards. They also won the, the major award of the um, the Green Globe Award, which is one of the highest sort of sustainability sort of awards they can get. So there were some great accolades came back for them. And from that, the Creative Centre has been completely booked out. It's getting used so much. The Northern Birches is benefiting hugely from it and they're expanding now. They want to build more of them. So yeah, has it been a great outcome? Yes. Let's talk about your Leichhardt penthouse. So that started as a as a laundry on, on top of a, was it an apartment block or a commercial? It was the fourth floor on the uh, top of a residential block of units. I was working for a developer in the eastern suburbs, you know, doing landscaping. So because my background, 35 years of landscaping doing this. Anyway, the developer said that he owned this block and he was going to sort of just clean up the gardens. I went and had a look for him and I looked at the roof and I was like, What? It was the floor space of six two-bedroom apartments. It had a 360-degree view, and wow. it was the laundry. So I suggested if we're going to do up the building, let's start the building out and so they could sell them off. Long story short, I got the roof and turned that into a tropical Balinese Mediterranean penthouse with outdoor bathrooms, outdoor bedrooms, and the outdoor space I found more advertising than the interior space. And, uh, yeah, like I said, with a 360-degree view, it became an icon. It broke a lot of uh, barriers down in the whole developing world because I was greening roofs. I was turning unused space into um, an icon, basically. It's really interesting, too, because what you've done does tie into a lot of the concepts that we do discuss on, on the series. That in itself, you've been able to create some instant equity in the sense that you've taken something that, or, you, or you've purchased or inherited something which really needed work done to it. But over time, you've transformed it and I know, obviously, the driving forces behind why you do what you do are on the foundations of environmentalism. And, the, and you know, we know you're a big advocate for that and you're very passionate about it. But also, there was a big financial gain, I would imagine, as a result of being able to transform that space. So it's a really good takeaway for people that possibly they, they own properties, they're listening to this, they, they might be on their first investment property, they might be on their 10th. And they might be revisiting their portfolio and saying, okay, well, how can we add value to this? And, you know, just to be able to think outside the square is a great starting point. Yes. And, and look, there was some great money made out of it. I, I wish I knew more about Lloyd's work then. So I knew how to leverage off it rather than selling property and getting rid of it. And so, yes, I'm really keen to read the book and find out a bit more. Oh, look, we always joke if we all had a crystal ball, yeah. <laughs> we'd all be a lot wealthier. <laughs> yeah, yeah.
Yeah, no, I've heard the stories. I've spoken to a lot of, I guess, wealthier people. They say buy, buy, never sell, you know. Like, I don't know, there was an old mantra almost. Yeah, I just wish I knew more about it. So, yes, I'm, I'm really looking forward to sort of learning how to leverage because that's the key. And I leverage with materials. I leverage with, with my resources and I still salvage materials and I still build things. But to learn how to do it on a bigger scale and, and yeah. on that monetary value because it's, I guess it's the same thing. It's like... A- it's exactly the same. And, and I think, you know, it, what's great is that probably until now i'm going to be really bold in saying this i don't think there would be any if not a very few it would definitely be in the minority people in this entire space so i'm talking the property investment property improvement space that have actually looked at leveraging at that level on both sides of the fence so leveraging financially but also now we're discussing today you know leveraging materials and the other costs associated with building wealth through property or, or building or renovating so in some respects you know it's quite groundbreaking what we're talking about today because now everybody listening has a full circle approach to basically have the awareness and ability to say okay well great we've listened to quite a bit of this series and we've got a pretty good understanding now of how we can leverage through property but now we've also had you on, Andrew, and had the benefit of saying, okay, well, have you considered leveraging your materials? Nobody's really touched on that in this space. So I think it's really exciting what we're talking about right now. Yeah, thank you. One of the big things, rubbish removal and or wasteful removal is actually really expensive. And so you, we really need to take that into consideration. And sometimes the materials need to go to landfill and whatever. But once you start seeing the value in the removal costs compared to the value in the pre-purchasing of, of landscaping materials and or even the rebuild, we've extended houses, built things from the materials that came out of an old house. I always like giving the example. It doesn't matter what style of landscape you want to build or how big it is. Say if I was coming in to do your work and we are going to do X, Y, Z on your project to give it a good entry point and barbecue, entertainment space, whatever. Because the three things I normally ask, and it's a good point to remember if you're going to dress up anything. The first question I ask a client is, what's your wish list? And on your wish list, it costs you nothing. So think about it and get your wife involved, your partner involved, your kids involved. What do you want from it? Do you want privacy screening? Whatever it may be. The second thing is a style or a theme. What's the overall look you're after? Do I want it Mediterranean tropical? Do I want it formal tropical? Do I want it rustic tropical? Try and put as many tags on it as you possibly can so everybody becomes on the same page whether it's the designer the developer the builder the architect they all get to see that that's the theme we're heading for so they can all inject their ideas around that theme you're essentially creating an identity for the property yes yes and giving it a name it doesn't tell you what to do it it doesn't tell you what not to do but it gives you a bit of a guideline of a direction where you can all head the third thing is a budget Now, most people go, oh, God, I don't know how much landscaping is. That's not the question. The budget is, what am I willing to invest into my lifestyle or what can I afford to invest in my lifestyle? The budget then also tells you two major things. If it's a large budget, you can get contractors and you can get other people to come in and build your dream. If your budget's small, you can still build exactly the same project, but you're going to invest a lot more of your own time and you're going to have to reclaim and salvage and and get more materials. So be wise on where these materials come from. Sometimes you can source Ebays and things and source other materials. I used to go to a lot of what I call demolition sites, deconstruction sites, and I'd go and pull a lot of the timbers and the stone, the trees and the plants. You know, I I could pull $100,000 worth of materials out of one property getting knocked down. It's a great segue into what was my next question, which is for the layman that's very new to this and might not have building experience, is there any tips you can give to identify what is salvageable? I mean, you've got the benefit of many years experience now, so you can probably look at some materials and say, great, I can use this timber paling for this. Or is it simply a case of just possibly bringing your builder down with you? Or what do you suggest for people that want to get started today, but they might not have the know-how in that space? I'd get a good understanding of the price or the value of materials. If they're going to do a renovation or a build or whatever it may be, they're going to do that anyway. So find out what a, a piece of 4 by 2 timber is worth, from pine to hardwood, from new to old. Do a bit of research. Find out what a plant's worth. Find out what a 6-inch tall little seedling or a 6-metre tall tree. Go and get, get some prices. And once you start seeing the value of of some of these materials, it'll give you a quick understanding of, wow, my budget's very small. I can put the small stuff in. It's going to take 10 years for it to mature. If I have a small budget and I have the resource mind to go and find these materials and dig out a couple of advanced plants, all of a sudden I've got that in two years and I've got this instant effect. I could make gardens look like they've been there forever in a couple of weeks. Which is quite remarkable really, isn't it? Especially if you're looking to then leverage on the value of the property to be able to borrow against it 
if you can give big wow factor boom instant look at this that's going to help you a lot in the value of the or the revaluation of the property Andrew, I want to talk about landscaping and gardens. We've spent some time discussing the, the there's so many environmental benefits for repurposing and, and everything you've done, once again, is very remarkable. If we're just to look strictly at a landscape for a property or improving a garden, the old saying was that kitchen sell homes, but I think gardens are, are just as important because as you mentioned, you know, from the conference you attended, that first impression is critical. To the perceived value of a home. Where do you recommend people start? Or in your experience, what do you find is a sure way to improve the, the feeling of a home through the landscaping? Um, over the years, I've come up with a, a set of principles, I guess. I was doing a talk for the Institute of Horticulture and over the phone, because I'm not really into computers, they wanted a few points that I was going to talk about so they could market it. So the first important part of landscape presentation was it has to be practical. So whether it's the directional paths, whether it's the positioning of the barbecue and entertainment space, whether it's the positioning of trees that are going to give you a bit of summer shade and, and then winter light, so maybe a deciduous tree, where the pergola is going to go to block out some of the heat. So it's got to be practical. It's got to work. And it's got to work for the people who that are either going to live there, if it's yourself or if it's an investment property, how it can be durable enough. Over the years too, Andrew, I find a lot of design is very period. So design changes and evolves over time, uh, particularly over decades as the needs and wants of human beings change. And we look at an art deco place from the, the 30s or 40s, whether it's a master build home today, the way that they're designed is very different. A lot's changed in that time. In your experience, how has landscaping changed over time in the sense, I think today there's definitely more of an emphasis towards outdoor spaces for entertainment. People want to spend spend a lot more time outdoors, particularly in the warmer months than ever before. Have you seen any particular trends of late? Our fresco living is definitely yeah, on the rise. People want to enjoy. We live in a, an amazing country, an amazing climate, really. But also, too, bringing in the elements to be able to have fire and part of the, the natural environment, bringing in wildlife, you know, having birds coming into your property and things like that. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. I guess even with this whole COVID thing, it's even made people even more conscious on dressing up their home and their living space and their gardens. All the landscape companies are selling out of all their products. The big hardware chains are selling out of all their seedlings and their plants and their edible food. So food has become more prominent. So maybe being conscious of, of putting fruit trees in rather than just a flowering tree. There's been a yeah, massive change, I guess. The other thing too I, I've observed is, and, and possibly this will be the continued shift in design, over the next 10 years, which is a lot of new architecturally designed homes really are focusing on bringing the outside in. So we're seeing, you know, more open living spaces, uh, the use of bifold doors, which pretty much open the whole internal space to the outdoors. I think that comes back to the point of when designing an outdoor space, make sure that there's that consistency and you know the whole team across the whole project is all working towards the same goal that way you can have that synergy I suppose between outdoor and indoor yeah well that's where I, I always say the wish list is so important if you want to create that indoor outdoor lifestyle I get the clients to get photographs I say show me pictures of something you love like I've designed designed whole homes interior exterior around a camel seat because I went to the client after hearing one designer saying we're going to put these velux aluminium awnings and it seemed out of keeping, and I was only there for a landscape quote. And when he left, I said, uh, show me something you love. And she showed me this seed. I said, I can make your whole house look along those themes. And she's like, what, what, what? Yeah, so having that theme is a very important part of getting everything on the same page. The other thing too is, and we briefly touched on this before, there, there's a lot of people that, whether it's renovating for a sale or to add value, they can very quickly cut that tree down or you know they might have some nice established gardens and very hastily they just start ripping everything out and starting from a blank canvas just the importance of taking a step back looking at what you've got how you can use it or repurpose it really ties in with a lot of your principles doesn't it it does and look some people may say look i actually don't like it it doesn't take away the value of it though like i said if you cut it down and remove it you've got to pay to get rid of it there are actually companies out there that will come and buy it from you so you can actually put it online somewhere and try and sell the product you know some people come and take the floors some people take the roof tiles some people take the trees the plants the stone so yeah it's not just how can i use it how can i give it another use 
I think we're going to have a rush of people after this podcast going to their backyards and <laughs> seeing what they can put online that they they've been planning to to get rid of or, or renovate. Yeah, and look, it's it's the old concept, yeah, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Like I turn waste back into wealth. It's like why not utilize some of these these amazing resources because it's not just the material, it's also the history, the story, the heritage of it, the gnarly burls on the branch of the trees and and so that story to me is, is of value than the than the monetary value. Absolutely. And I think particularly depending on bringing it back to investing, where you're holding those properties. I mean, if you're in an area where, for example, there's a certain significance around the way homes were designed throughout any period of time, obviously a lot of parts of Australia have heritage and restrictions on improvements to building. And the reason that those are in place is because I think as a country, we, we do want to protect where we've come from. And that's why we have those measures in place. The story keeping something closely in line with as it was does add an intangible value to a property. Yes, big time. Yeah, another little example is I do a lot of work in TIPS, waste sites. They're resource recovery centres now. They're not not allowed to be called recycling centres. They actually don't recycle. But they do salvage and recover materials and separate and then send them off to the right right places. The local one, Kim Bricky, I set up the Eco House and Garden. I've done a lot of work improving that garden and education centre. From that, I've built what they call wicking beds. These wicking beds are a great little adventure if you want to grow veggies and stuff in the garden. They have a water reservoir on the base which self-waters the plant and it directs the water to where the plants need it, to the roots. It's very efficient in how it works. The one yesterday, we delivered one to Government House. Yeah, so the tin from the garden bed came from the Avalon School, the roof. The timber posts in the corner of the garden bed, old bearers that came from an old house in Forest Way. The frame that's, that frames the seat on top of the garden bed are uh, roof trusses. And then we even put an old metal bed head in the back of the garden bed uh, just to sort of uh, make it a bit quirky. And this is now sitting in Government House and its view is the Opera House and the Harbour Bridge. So there's secondhand materials that have been given another life, but it's also part of history now. And it's good to see too at that level... There's definitely movements towards environmentalism and, you know, reuse of materials. We won't use the word recycling, but <laughs> it seems that more and more people are becoming conscious of the importance of this. Uh, I even look at recent design in the last decade with high-rise buildings in the city. I mean, there's, I think, across from the UTS campus, there's the um, the building with all of the, the plants throughout it. So there's people that are now really conscious at a higher level that are trying to incorporate these designs into developments. Greening our spaces in any way or form is a benefit. You know, we rely on them, you know, living on this planet. So putting plants inside the building, having plants outside the building. You know, you go to Singapore and they green wall nearly all of the buildings around there. And there's some great designers out there playing with a lot of, you know, technologies now that make it easier and easier. But you can do it yourself. And so just being conscious enough, walking into a place where you have good green space compared to pretty harsh you know, concrete sort of filled areas is, is chalk and cheese. You feel the energy of the plant material. Where do you see this going over the next decade or two in terms of where we are now to where it could go in terms of overall design? Are you beyond what you're currently advocating pushing for anything more in the space in terms of how people can use landscapes both inside and out, obviously the reuse of materials, you know, we've just discussed uh, green walling. Do you have a, a particular view for where this can go? Well, going back to the principles that we, I started sort of talking about, first I said it had to be practical. It spells peace, basically. So it's practical, environmentally sound for both you and the environment, aesthetically pleasing, cost-effective and educational. So to me, the more people can learn from your project, your development, and feel at home in there, so following those peace principles, to me, that's where it's going. And, that, and the more conscious we are of living this sort of respectful lifestyle is what's going to take us into a healthy and take our kids and grandkids and whatever into a healthy environment in the future. Andrew, we've covered off on a lot of topics today. I think there's a lot of people that are going to go into their gardens now and reassess what they can and can't repurpose and, and possibly looking for those who are in the midst of a renovation, they'll probably be looking at all their materials that are sitting in a skip and seeing what they can do with those. Is there anything else that you'd like to get across for our listeners today that are probably new to a lot of what we've discussed? I guess the biggest thing for me is is the word respect. In the waste hierarchy, you've got the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. They missed out respect. If we can respect everything, whether that's the, the waste or so-called waste that's being created on a project, whether it's the materials that, that could be utilised, whether it's the kids being acknowledged in the build, giving them somewhere to play in that growing more food. Because it's, at some stage, if we rely on everybody else to provide for us, 
we're re- relinquishing our own power. And so growing food and looking after our kids and looking after our materials and resources is one of the, I, th- I believe, is one of the most environmentally sound conscious decisions we can make. It's very true. I suppose the other thing too, and this is just a thought off the cuff, you know, where there's a lot of time spent, we talk about, okay, we need to reduce our carbon footprint. Of course, this is a big thing at the moment, and it has been for some time. Instead of always focusing on reducing, 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 because everything's got a point where you've exhausted how much you can reduce something, getting people in the garden, planting their own vegetables and, and growing things, as you mentioned, you're also creating something new. So not just being in a headspace of reducing, but through creation. And I suppose that's why green walling's become very popular. We're creating new environments to, that we can thrive off. One of the big things is, is people hear the word reduce and they think they've got to go without. That's not what I'm saying. Use and, and respect everything. To me, there's, there's an abundance of materials. I, I believe the economists have it wrong. We've actually never run out of anything. Our minds are our only true resource and we can come up with and create and fix and manufacture the next new thing. So I I don't do what I do because of the environment. I don't do it to reduce the load on the carbon levels. I do it to respect that particular resource, whether it's an old heritage brick or something like that. I love the character in it. I used to think I found it and now I've come to the terms that it found me. It knows I listen. And so I have an abundance of material rolling in every day. And it's all out there. It's all out there to be used. So I don't do what I do to save the planet. I do what I do to respect and utilise these beautiful character materials uh, to their highest you know, level. So being mindful of um, why you're doing it can be purposeful in itself. It's been really great having you on the show today, Andrew. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I think all our listeners will take a lot away from our podcast today. Yeah, no, I'm grateful and thanks for having me and so looking forward to learn more about it because, yeah, I, I know that my future is going to be in and in, in around property because I love it, and, but learning how to leverage and how to sort of maximise and, and get, get bigger bang for my buck is going to be a positive. So thank you. My pleasure. And on behalf of Lloyd, I'm sure that there'll be lots of golden nuggets in the book Positively Geared. So I hope you look forward to uh, having a, a, a further look into that. I am. And thank you. Thanks again. And Andrew, anybody that would like to learn more about what you're doing, uh, where can they find you? I've got a few different areas you can contact through. I have a website, so it's uh, www.aolandscapes.com.au. But you can also check out my Facebook site, Garden Projects Australia, Wicking Beds on Facebook, and Get Wicked. So yeah, there's a few different spots they can have a look at the different things I'm doing and showcasing simple ways to, uh, I guess, be more sustainable and, and respect resources. So yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Andrew. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.